Hello and welcome to our very special guest event today. I'm Rada from Little Crafters Boxes and I am joined by the lovely Professor Tony Redmond. Hello Tony. Hello. Um, so if you don't already know, uh, Dr. Tony is um, an A&E doctor for over 30 years. He's worked around the world providing aid through natural disasters, disease and war. He is the director of the Nightingale Hospitals in Northwest from the pandemic. And he is also the founder of charity UK Med. Um, wow, Dr. Tony, you've been just a bit busy over the last few years. Yeah. Um, so let us know if you can see and hear us okay and pop replay in the comments if you are watching on replay. So the purpose of today will be to learn a little bit about Dr. Tony Redmond and um, see a real life example of a person that has had lots of challenges in his life um, and he's kept on pushing forward and been able to achieve all the amazing things that he has. So we are very, very lucky to join for that he's joining us today and Hopefully, we're going to hear some great stories about what he's been up to. Um, so, uh, uh, is it Dr. Tony or Dr. Redmond? How do you like to be addressed? Uh, people normally just call me Prof. <laughs> prof. Okay, okay, Prof. <laughs> we'll call you Prof for the purpose of today then. Um, so, what are you doing now then, Prof? Are you still uh, practicing medicine? Uh, yes, I am. I don't, um, I don't work in a hospital any, anymore. Uh, I work uh, for the World Health Organization. Um, I, that's based in Geneva, but I can do a lot of my work from, from home. But uh, some years ago, I, I, with colleagues, we set up a system with the World Health Organization to get standards for medical teams that respond to disasters and to make sure these teams are properly registered. For those of you who don't know the the World Health Organization is the, uh, the body that we all look to all around the world to set standards for the delivery of healthcare. Wow. And I've worked with them for, for, for many years. I, I'm a, I act as a consultant for them. So I uh, work on their behalf with other countries to help them set the standards for responding to large scale emergencies. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Brilliant. Um, so I've got another question, and I've got a question for the children um, that are watching today and for you, um, Prof. So um, for the children, what do you want to be when you grow up? And for Prof, <laughs> I'm not going to get used to that. No, you can ask that for me as well. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, and when you decided you wanted to be a doctor. Okay, I, um, you can probably tell by my accent, I'm from Manchester and I was born in Failsworth, which is a suburb of uh, Manchester, in, in, in the north of Manchester. I was born a long time ago, in 1951, and uh, I just went to the local school. Uh, in those days, we had the 11 plus, I passed the 11 plus, went to a grammar school, and I was always interested in science subjects. My parents hadn't been to university. I'm still the only member of my family who went to university, uh, but I was very interested in science subjects, did well in them. And I was lucky in that the head of the medical school in Manchester was from uh, North Manchester and he was very keen to encourage kids from ordinary backgrounds, if you like, to uh, to go to medical school if they, you know, if they fancied it, and he came and gave a talk at the at the uh, at at my school when I was in the sixth form, and I got talking to him, and I remember afterwards, uh, the small group of us who stayed on to talk to me even further after that, the headmaster came to me and said. Um, if I were you and you want to do medicine, I would apply to Manchester because uh, I realised without me knowing he was actually giving me an interview for, for, for the medical school because I wasn't used to anything like that. I thought it was very kind of him. So I had a sort of informal interview and 
I got in to do medicine and I haven't looked back ever since. That's great. So it started really with an interest, wasn't it, that you followed all the it way through? It started with an interest in science and an interest in biology. And also I did, I, I did want to help people. I, I genuinely did. I think we can be a bit too shy of admitting that. You know, like even me, the first thing I said, oh, I was interested in science. Well, actually, the first thing I was interested in was helping people. I mean, there are many ways that you can help people, but medicine is, you know, is an obvious one, and I, and I wanted to, to make a difference, and uh, medicine has provided that for me. It's incredibly interesting, and it, you know, you you are given opportunities to really help people, and it's also because of the work that I've done uh, allowed me to travel all around the world and see people in circumstances you wouldn't normally see them and be invited into their homes and, and their families and many of whom i'm still in contact with and it's um it's been an absolute joy and uh, and a privilege brilliant well i think you can certainly safely say that you've made a difference throughout your life if that's what you're aiming to do um i can also see from the comments we've got quite a mixed bag here today um, okay. We've got somebody that wants to be a vet or a paleontologist. We've got a future train conductor within our midst. <laughs> Olympic skateboarder, logo maker, gymnast. Goodness me, we've got all. We've got an awful mix, uh, an awful, an awfully big mix here. And we've got a local Manchester uh, person here. Radian wants to be a paleo paleontologist. Paleontologist, very good. Yes, yeah. I was at the. Um... At the Manchester Museum at the weekend with with, with, with my grandchildren. Oh, I right. encourage you all to go. The exhibition is fantastic. Oh, lovely! I think actually, Dawn. I know Dawn. Dawn actually works in our team. I'm fairly certain she's been to the Manchester Museum. Mm. Um, we've got an a restaurant entrepreneur with an animatronic animal ca characters. Goodness me! I saw the first one of those when I uh, I worked in the um, in the United States early on in in, in, in my career and uh, went to Chuck E. Cheese, <laughs> which is a, a restaurant where they have an animatronic mouse who's Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, Brilliant. And I, because I was reading about Chuck E. Cheese only the other day that the animatronics are still run on floppy disks. They've still, they've never updated them. And I think they're probably the world's only users now of floppy disks. So there you go. Oh. oh. <laughs> floppy, floppy disk, Good. that takes me back a little bit to the 90s. I bet there's lots of children here that have never seen a floppy disk in their lives. <laughs> no, but if you look on your computer and you look at the storage bit, first of all, it's a file and they also have an image of a floppy disk, even though computers don't have them now. That's right, the save icon, that is a floppy disk, you're right. <laughs> um, right, okay, so I have another question. One for you and one for the children again. So children, tell us about one challenge that you sometimes face when you are learning or in everyday life. Um, and Prof, <laughs> what are some of the challenges that you faced when you were studying to become a doctor and how did you overcome them? Okay, shall I go first? Yeah. Um, one of the very early challenges was actually finding a physical space to study. Uh, I'd come from a large family, there were uh, six children and we also had an aunt that lived with us and my parents, we fostered a child and it was a small house and it was very crowded. And so um, I used to go to the central library in Manchester after school because uh, it was quiet and there were books and I used to do my homework there and do my studying there and then go home because uh, the house was just too chaotic to get any studying done i mean i have a very loving family but um a very robust family shall, shall we say. so the, the thought of me sitting quietly trying to read books in the corner was not what my brothers and sisters thought i should be doing so i so so, so that was that was my first challenge and um and then um at medical school it was really just keeping up with the volume of work that you have to do. 
It actually gets easier after you qualify when you specialise. But when you're at medical school, you you have to know a bit about everything. That even though when you specialise afterwards, then you don't need to know all those things again. You know something about them, but but you specialise. So it was the sheer volume of work. But yeah, um, that that was uh, that was hard, uh, Did- but not. But it was only it was the same for everybody. I mean, we all we 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 all had to cope with the with, with the volume of work. And then, once I qualified, the long hours that was um, my. I, I'm, I remember telling my parents, and they wouldn't believe me. But the first contract I signed as a doctor was for 136 hours a week. Yeah. <laughs> And underneath that, it said, and any other times that the hospital might need you. <laughs> Did you ever go home or were you just there all the just time? Just alternate nights. So you'd do Monday, Monday night, Tuesday, Tuesday night home, Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night home, Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night, Monday, Monday night home. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they gave you a room in the hospital. Oh, well, that was kind of it. <laughs> yeah, well, and very different now. There were lots more doctors in the hospital. Although you you were contracted to do more hours, it wasn't it wasn't like it is now. It wasn't as hard a work as it is now, because there were lots of you in the hospital. You could share tasks between you, so you could go and get some sleep, and other people would manage it for you. Um, the only burden was that you had to be in the hospital all that time, but. You got when you were on call. You got free meals. You got free accommodation. Hospital canteen stayed open all the time. It was, it was a very different world. I do feel very sorry for the young doctors now who have to work far harder than I ever did. And for like, yeah. Um, so we've got again. We've got quite a mixed bag of here of challenges here as well in the comments. So we've got one, uh, I think this is, is the child, uh, memory stroke they struggle with. Do you know, I can relate to that. I struggle with memory sometimes. I feel as though there's lots of things in my head all the time. And sometimes things just fall out, don't they, when there's, when there's too much going on. It's funny, when I used to go in and do exams, I had that feeling because I've got so much in my head. I was frightened to shake my head because I thought it would all fall <laughs> out. <laughs> I didn't just keep it in. <laughs> Luckily, you kept it all in. <laughs> Um, well, it's good to know that we're not the only ones um, and that you've been through it too. Um, Carson here struggles with low processing speed and has to be given plenty of time to process. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't very good at exams, by the way. I would, so any of you um, were not, but I, 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 I wasn't very good at exams. I, I found it difficult to, um, to sort of learn it all in my head, to keep it all in my head. And I was never quite sure of what the question, what were they really asking me? And uh, I just found that whole process uh, difficult. But I got through. And uh, I tell um, people now, people, for for example, doing medicine, they worry about their exams. I said, just pass it. As long as you can pass it, then you can get out and and then you can practice. And actually, I found being a doctor much much more straightforward than actually studying to be one. Do you think that's because you hope you got to have hands-on experience and actually do the do the job rather than learn about yes, it? I find that if I can make it relevant to something, then I can then, then I can um, then I can learn it. So I found once I started treating patients, I went back and relearned a lot. You know, you learn anatomy. You, which is where all your bones are, for for example. And you just try and learn it from the pictures. I I mean, I could do it. I found it hard. But once you see somebody with a broken arm, you know what it is, then it all became much clearer. And then I could, uh, yes, I could learn it much more. And even how things work, I studied all that. It's called physiology as to how everything works. But... uh, Okay, I I could learn it. But once you see people who are ill and it's gone wrong and you've got to fix it, then it all became much clearer. I could understand it more. Seems a bit odd that by seeing it go wrong, you helped me understand how it should work. But it did. And I found once I got um, 
got out into the world of being a doctor, it all fell into place. And I did uh, quite literally go back over things that I'd studied as a medical student and redid them again to, um, to freshen it and make it relevant to what I was doing. That's fantastic. It's, it's music to my ears to hear you saying that because everything we do here is about learning through play, learning through doing. And it's all learning. Yeah. And it's often the best you, kind of learning. Yes, often you learn things. So sometimes I've, I've always thought, you know, unless you're sat in a classroom, unless you're, uh, you're doing it from a book or unless, then it doesn't count as learning. But I learned a lot of things in medicine from my colleagues. I learn much better by people talking to me uh, than by reading it. I, I tell you a story now, you probably don't know. No, no. <laughs> but to learn clinical medicine, I, I knew I would get it much better if I interacted with somebody and spoke about it. And I was told at one hospital where I was a student uh, that, uh, that there was a, a lady doctor I was going to tell you her name and perhaps I shouldn't, but I'd heard <laughs> that she was very good and a very good teacher, um, but was a bit brusque, shall we say, a bit difficult, a bit, you know. And But I thought, no, so, so I I turned up on the ward where she used to go around and see all the patients before she went home. And I came and, and started going around war trap with her. And she tried to tell me, to, you know, she was too busy and all that. But I kept turning up, and I remember about the third or fourth time when I turned up, she said, you're not going to go away, are you? I said, no, I've heard you're really good, and I want you to teach me. And and she was very good then, and she we went around each patient, and I had to go and see them beforehand, and then tell her what I thought was the matter, and then give her the, the three commonest causes of what it might be. And we did that night after night. And then when I was getting really good, she says, and now I want five causes. <laughs> <laughs> we got up to 10, <laughs> but 10 <laughs> causes of what it might be. And I really learned that way just by uh, talking to somebody. And then I did go back and look it up in the books, but I had, a, I had something, if you like, to hang it on to. I've always found it much easier to... Um, to learn uh, by people describing and in conversation and asking questions. That to, I find if I sit down with something, I start thinking about what I'm going to have for my tea or what, you know. <laughs> instead of what the weather's going to be. <laughs> and then you come back to it. So I've got to find out the following rather than just start reading through. I, think I want to find out, you know, can some. Can such and such a thing cause this heart condition? I can go and look that up. That's fine. But I start with having recognised the problem. There are different ways of learning. I worked at medical school with some people who learned very differently, uh, who, who could learn straight from the books. Um, I, I, I couldn't. Obviously, I did read the books, but it was, it was the interaction that was much more important for me. That's really useful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sure there's children here that will resonate with that an awful lot. Um, I'll read a few more of these. So some of the other challenges we've got here, not, not getting distracted and retaining information. Um, I think we can all relate to that to, to a point, can't we? Yeah. Um, and doing short bits, I found it too, that I you can always go back. So you learn a little, well, for me, learn a little bit, go back and get a little bit more, get a little bit more. That's great. Cameron struggles with understanding um, as things can be worded in a confusing way for him. That's fair. Uh, Joanne, uh, the first computer we had as kids, I'm 45. I think she's talking about a Commodore 64. I'm sure I saw something right. about it earlier on. Do you remember those? I do. I, 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 I remember uh, trying to learn uh, BASIC, the uh, computer program. But then, of course, because uh, we had um, an Amstrad computer at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lord oh, uh, yeah, but we, we had an Amstrad and, and learned to program it. But, of course, Bill Gates and Microsoft quickly came in and you just didn't need to learn it. It was all done for you. You bought, you bought the package. Brilliant. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I remember those. Um, we've got one more. We've got Lewis that says he struggles with autism and um, her superpower. Lewis struggles with autism and her superpower is ADHD. Yeah. Um, and somebody's saying it's really helpful. I find it easier to learn hands on. Yeah. yeah. I think that's definitely a thing. I'm, I've taught over years and years, and I've always found that it's far easier to teach things, especially difficult concepts, um, when you make it into something practical, when it's something yeah. And I found, again, with difficult things, is just keep going over it. You can't, you might, you know, for, first, first of all, particularly in medicine, is understanding what the words mean. Doctors are terrible at giving long words for things so you have to, so it's like learning a new language you know like uh, the jargon it's jargon so so you would say like if, if if a rash a skin rash is red a doctor will say it's erythematous erythematous yes which is greek for red <laughs> <laughs> so you know and if you've got um uh, uh red lumps you know then they say it's erythema nodosum, which is a red lump. <laughs> it's just <laughs> so it's um, so. So you have to learn. You have to learn that language. Yeah. And incidentally, though, having learned the medical language, it's made it easier to work in other countries. Because is it? Because if you don't speak English, there is a common medical language. Ah. That, that people use names of diseases, names of conditions and things. And so it's, I was surprised how, you know, I've worked in many different countries and um, once you get speaking about an illness or a patient, or that, then the phrases cut across languages, which often gave me a false sense of security when socializing, thinking I could speak the local language when clearly I didn't. <laughs> Well, if you go anywhere and say erythemodosis, will they know what that is? Yes, if you said erythemodosum, they would know what it is. That's In cool. fairness, it's referred to a specific type of red lump that is characteristic of other conditions that go with it. Ah, right. It well, just, means red, just means red lump. So I'm not sure red lump is going to be the top top topic of conversation if I went to another country, but at least I know a word that they might be able to understand. <laughs> Right, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic, um, because obviously it's quite fairly recent and I'm sure that the children will remember it. Yeah. Um, so, Is it true that uh, you were working for the university as a consultant and nearly retired when you started um, the Nightingale Hospital in the North West? Yes, I, was, I, I, um, I work at the, at the university, I, I, I still work at the university, but I was about to retire from clinical practice. Uh, because you you can uh, work uh, as a doctor in seeing patients called clinical practice, or you can do research and teaching, which is academic practice. So I thought, well, I'll start cutting down a bit, and I would give up the clinical side and just do the research and teaching. But then I was asked by uh, the health service, the NHS, would I help them set up the Nightingale Hospital in Manchester for the treatment of COVID patients because the charity that I set up, UK Med, had run the Ebola treatment centres in West Africa. So we knew all about P the famous PPE. We knew how to manage that safely, how to keep nurses and doctors safe from contracting the infection while they were treating patients. So, uh, so I became the medical director of the Nightingale Hospital. Yeah. But I'm not now because the Nightingale Manchester one it stayed open for a year. And then they closed it, didn't they? And then they closed it, yeah. We, 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 were, the, we were the only one to stay open for a year. Really? Yeah. Um so we had a question coming from one of our um, audience yesterday who actually asked why was the Nightingale um hospital shut down even though there was a shortage of NHS beds? Well, um, that was a government decision, was, was, was the first thing. And it relates to staffing. So they, they, there was a potential for the one in Manchester to have 650 beds, but we didn't have the staff 
to, right. uh, to, 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 to manage that. The initial thinking by the government was that because we didn't have all the testing to start off with, that people suspected of having COVID would go into these Nightingale hospitals and then if they become more real, they would go into the NHS. But but they they changed that and said, in fact, they, everyone would go into the NHS and then the Nightingale Hospital, certainly the one in Manchester, became a rehabilitation centre. Right. For people who had, who had recovered uh, but were not well enough to go home or needed further support and because of all the problems in care homes they couldn't go into care homes so so they came to us so we so the manchester one had people staying for a long time in there and it was mainly elderly the average age was 86 i think wow. was 86 the, and average. Four, the average and we had four patients over the age of 100. wow yeah so it so it fulfilled a a, a very different well yeah and then it had to go back to being the exhibition center that it was. yes of course it was the manchester arena wasn't it uh no that was that's uh that that that's another venue it was called oh. manchester central right. which was an exhibition center but it was okay. called that be again because i'm so old because it used to be manchester central railway station yes and you took your first train there didn't you I did and i went on a steam truck steam train from there to get the ferry over to Ireland uh, to, uh, when I was, that would be in the 1950s. Yeah. So it was very unusual, you know, it was a, a weird experience for me to be back in that, to me, central station, but it now being a hospital. Wow, so you, you first took your first steam train there a long, yeah. long time ago, and then yeah. years later, you were in charge of the entire Nightingale Hospital on the yes, same ground. Yes, and, and, uh, d yeah, it was, um, it was an, an interesting experience. The, the, the Nightingale Hospital um, was, you know, we had to mobilise very quickly and um, we got lots of volunteers. Uh, but of course, we couldn't take staff from the NHS because they were needed there, obviously. So we, uh, but we did need lots of, say, of healthcare workers. We, we got a lot of, um, cabin crew from the airlines came to work with us. Oh, wow. Because they, they, uh, the airlines weren't flying, so they were available. But of course, they're, they're very highly trained and they're all trained in basic first aid. So that they could, so we could quickly upskill them to be healthcare assistants. Oh, brilliant. And they were really good. Yeah, so that worked out really well, actually, didn't it? Did it did work out really well. They were yeah. they were a great bunch. And you had lots of people coming out of retirement, didn't you? Old, older yeah, doctors. people coming out of retirement. And again, um, we had, a, say, a consultant specialist eye surgeon. Now, we didn't need them to do eye surgery, but they, but they can work as a junior doctor on, oh. on the ward because, they, because they're on the medical register and they've got all the, the basic skills. So we had a whole mix of people. It was, um, there was a great sense of, you know, what we're all, all, all in this together. And of course at the start, we, we didn't know how the hospital would be used and, and so on. Uh, but everyone was very flexible. Yeah. yeah, how wonderful to hear it from the other side, because obviously we all heard it from the media and what was going on, you know, direct, we were all in lockdown and not allowed to leave our houses, but it's so lovely to hear your side from, you know. And what's interesting there. was that um, uh, so all my family were in lockdown and they didn't go out all the time, but I went to work every day, I could get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, I remember it. I was a teacher back then, back, back then so I was um, out there as well uh, in schools teaching at that time. Um, but the world was so different, wasn't it? Um, yeah, things have changed a lot. Uh, well, so we've got a question here for you. Yep. Prof, um, in your international work, did you focus purely on medical emergencies or did you also advise on wider emergency situations in which you need to be aware of medical problems that may arise quickly? Good question, Lizzie. Yeah, yeah, both. Um, we we have, uh, if I set up the emergency medical team uh, 
for the United Kingdom. So Arnat was set up in Manchester and is still based in Manchester. So the international medical response from the UK comes out of Manchester. We recruit from across the UK and now internationally, but it's all comes out of Manchester. And we, for example, now we have teams uh, in Turkey still uh, treating um, uh, people who've been injured from, 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 from the earthquake. We have teams all across Ukraine dealing with the problems of the war. We have a team in Malawi at the moment because there's a cholera outbreak there, but also there's been a cyclone. So we have teams there. So, so we have teams dealing with emergencies all around the world. But we also work uh, with countries to help them prepare better for this. So we're, you know, we're always busy. We're not just, just waiting for the next emergency or disaster. We do help people train. So coming back to, to, to the pandemic, we worked in 26 countries helping them prepare for the pandemic and how to respond to it when it came. So, um, so yes, and both, both are really Im important. I I'm tempted to say that the preparation is more important than the... Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, but in practical terms, you still need, you know, you, you have to... You need both. To, to, ...to respond quickly and, and, and do both. But, but training and preparing is, is very important. Great. Okay. So now is a great time, guys. If anybody's got a question for doc, for, for Prof, <laughs> uh, ask in the comments now. I was just about to invite them, but they're already coming, look. So we've got another one here. Is there anywhere in the world you wished you had worked? Yes. I, I, I have never actually uh, worked in South America. Uh, and that's partly because I, there is a separate Pan-American Health Organization, which it's actually just a bit older than the World Health Organization, and they manage uh, emergencies in uh, South America. And also, they expect you to speak Spanish or Portuguese, and I don't. Okay. So, uh, so I've never managed to that, which I would love to, because uh, my late father worked in Argentina when he was a young man, and I'd like, and I've, I've never been. To Buenos Aires, where 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 he, he works, it's on my list of things to do. Uh, so, so yes, good question. And uh, uh, South America. Oh, there you go. Maybe one day when you actually do retire, you can go across and. Have I'd love to. I'd love to. <laughs> do your children or grandchildren work in the medical field? No, well, my grandchildren are too young yet, but they um, certainly two of them are very keen on electrical engineering. Uh, the, the, the youngest girl, she wants to be an electrical engineer, and I think my grandson is very keen on electrical engineering. My eldest granddaughter isn't so sure yet what 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 she'll do. Uh, my children, the you know, they are the two of I've got three three daughters. Uh, one did the eldest did physics, and then. Um, environment the masters in environmental technology brilliant and then the middle one did economics and statistics and then a master's in health economics so she's the nearest she works as a data analyst and data manager for the health service wow but then the youngest did history of art and then did a master's in humanitarian and conflict studies and now works at the university of manchester on research governance so same university as you yes right yeah. we see each other much in the day yeah yeah we do, we oh, do. Lovely. <laughs> and uh, and so it's quite interesting because if i apply for research grants and they have to go through the governance office and i know my daughter will be inspected <laughs> <laughs> and she's Brilliant. very strict <laughs> <Is she? laughs> no dad you can't have this yeah. <laughs> Uh, right, we've got another one. We oh, this is a really good question. This was actually on my list of things to ask you as well. Um, well have you ever been scared in a medical emergency? Yes, yeah. I, um, um, I, I have been in some very dangerous situations, and uh, yes, I have been scared. And how do you I, handle that when you feel scared? Sorry. How do you handle that when you're feeling scared? There, there are a number of things. What, 
first of all, for me, what I'm doing has to be worth it. I, 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 I'm not reckless. And I, um, in many ways, I'm quite timid. I, 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 but so, so it has to be worth it. And then the other thing is to be well prepared for it. So we, we train a lot. We, I, I know what to do in, 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 in an emergency. And so you still get frightened. But if you have a plan, um, we, we always, you know, we say prepare, practice, have a plan. Uh, then, it, then it's manageable. Brilliant. Thank you. That's uh, that's really lovely. I'm sure that that's useful for lots of children. Um, I'm going to ask. I'll ask one more audience question. Then there's one from me, and then we're going to wrap it up because I'm conscious we've gone over half an hour. Um, if you weren't a doctor, what would you be? Oh, what would I don't know. Well, in another life, uh, I, I'm a musician, and uh, I've always played in bands since I, since I was a teenager. Uh, and I still do. Brilliant. Um, what is a, you play? I play the guitar. Do you? Yeah, and uh, which I have done since since teenager. And uh, I would love to have, uh, you know, been a professional musician. I'm not saying I'm that good, but I would have loved to 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 have done that. Uh, there are a group of uh, a group of us uh, nurses and doctors uh, of a certain age who. Uh, <laughs> who play in a band called The Palpitations. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. <laughs> so um, so, uh, so that, that would be my alternative life, I guess. Fabulous. Doctor by day, rock star by night. Well, steady, I mean, you know, I think. <laughs> wouldn't go that far. But, um, but, um, but yeah, I really enjoy playing. And I, when I was... Uh, very much younger. Uh, I used to play five nights a week at one time in various clubs and things. I uh, really enjoyed it. Brilliant. Uh, right, one last question from me then, um, Prof. <laughs> can do can people do anything to support your work or uh, reach reach you if they want to find out more about you? Yes, people. Uh, yeah, people can email me. You've, you've got my uh, contact details. Yeah. With, with all the work that. Um, that I do, people in, in emergencies, it's very tempting to, to want to send them things. And in practical terms, that's usually not very effective, even though you want to, because uh, you, know, people, you want to send them clothes or toys or things. To actually get them to where they're needed costs a lot of money. And so uh, whoever you're donating to, they've got to spend their money to first of all clean the things that you've got, package them, store them, sort them, then transport them, and then when they arrive wherever they got, the same thing has got has got to happen. And so the easy, the most effective thing to do uh, is to give money. Now you will say, well, you don't know where the money goes. Well, if you give to a, a, a reputable, very public organisation, you do know where the money goes. The problem with giving things is that they do tend to get lost on the way not all not always and if you if you can be sure that you know exactly where it's going to go and it will get there then fair enough but but in general terms it's much better to to donate to donate money and it doesn't matter how how much there's no you know every little does does help and then it can be spent locally but i was in ukraine just before christmas and they're still trying to keep everything going that uh, shops are trying to stay open so if people can purchase what they want locally then it actually helps the economy helps the stop shops to stay open helps to maintain as normal a life as possible in a very abnormal circumstance brilliant Fabulous. So you've got a charity, don't you? UK Med, that's still UK. running. Yeah. Um, we could potentially make donations to that, can we? If we want to. can indeed, yeah. Uh, we, uh, I think the little crafters will definitely be making a donation. Oh, that'd be great. Um, and, you know, rest assured that um, I, I know where the money goes. I mean, I, 
I set up the charity and I watch everything we do. That's one of the reasons I was in Ukraine before Christmas. I went around all our programs to make sure uh, that you know we're doing the right thing and we're doing it well. And um, I was very pleased with the reception that their work is getting. And the World Health Organization, as well as the Ukrainian government, all really support what we're doing. And it's the same in Turkey and it's the same, same in Malawi. Great. Fabulous. Okay, well, thank you so much for talking with us today. Um, we will definitely check um, out your charity and find out more about your work. I've got your book here, by the way, which I've been oh, okay. reading uh, for the last... I haven't quite got to the end yet, but um, I'm sort of making my way through it. Um, as time goes on, it's, really, it's a really good read if anyone's interested in that. I got it off Amazon. Um, yeah, thank you again for talking to us. It's been so interesting listening to you and some of your experiences. Uh, and I'm sure that the children got a lot from it as well today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.